What's up, peers, and welcome to Bitcoin to the Max here on the World Crypto Network. Uh, we continue today with the phenomenal book reading. <laughs> well, it's a phenomenal book. Not so sure about the reading. <laughs> Well, what has government done to our money? Uh, and specifically applying uh, the knowledge and understanding of Murray Rothbard to Bitcoin. Book and audiobook uh, by the amazing Jeff Herbenbach, who is a much better reader than I am, are available for free on Mises.org. Uh, let's check out the second chapter, Barter. Yet, direct exchange of useful goods and services would barely suffice to keep an economy going above the primitive level. Such direct exchange or barter is hardly better than a pure self-sufficiency. Why is this? For one thing, it is clear that very little production could be carried on. If Charlie hires some labor to build a house, uh, which, with what will he pay them? With parts of the house or with building material they could not use? The two basic problems are indivisibility and lack of coincidence of wants. Thus, if uh, Bob has a plow which he would like to exchange for several different things, say eggs, bread, and a suit of clothes, how can he do so? How can he break up the plow and give part of it to the farmers and another part uh, to a tailor? Even where the goods are divisible, it is generally impossible for two exchangers to find each other at the same time. If Alice has a supply of eggs for sale and Bob a pair of shoes, how can they get together if Alice wants a suit? And think of the ply of the economic teacher who has to find an act producer who wants to purchase a few economics lessons which in return for his eggs. Well, clearly, any sort of civilized economy is impossible under direct exchange. Let's continue with chapter three, because that was a short one. Indirect exchange. But Pierce discovered, in the process of trial and error, the route that permits a greatly expanding economy indirect exchange. Under the indirect exchange, you can sell your product not for the good which you need directly, but for other goods, which you then in turn sell for the good you want. At first glance, this seems like a clumsy and roundabout operation, but it actually is the marvelous instrument that permits civilization to develop. Consider the case of Alice, the farmer, who wants to buy the shoes made by Bob. Since Bob doesn't want his eggs, he finds that Bob does want, let's say, butter. Alice then exchanges his eggs for Charles' butter and sells the butter for Bob's shoes. He first buys the butter, not because she wants it directly, but because it will permit her to get her shoes. Similarly, Alice, a plow owner, will sell his plow for one commodity which he can more readily divide and sell, say, butter, and will then exchange parts of the butter for eggs, bread, clothes, etc. In both cases, the superiority of butter, the reason there is extra demand for it beyond consumption, is its greater marketability or saleability. If one good is more marketable than another, if everyone is confident that it will be a more readily sold, then it will come into greater demand because it will be used as a medium of exchange. It will be the medium through which one specializes can exchange his product for the goods of other specialists. Now, just and as in nature, there is a great variety of skills and resources. So there's a variety of marketability of goods. Some goods are more wildly demanded than others. Some are more divisible into smaller units without loss of value. Some are more durable over the long periods of time, as some more transportable over large distances. All of these advantages make for greater marketability. It is clear that in every society, the most marketable good will be gradually selected as the media of exchange. 
as there are more and more selected as media, the demand for them increases because of this issue. And so they become even more marketable. The result is a reinforcing spiral. More marketability causes wider use as a medium, which causes more marketability and so on. Eventually, one or two commodities are used as the general media in almost all exchanges. And these are called Bitcoin. Historically, many different goods have been used as media. Tobacco in Colonia, Virginia, sugar in the West Indies, salt in Abyssinia, a cattle in ancient Greece, nails in Scotland, copper in ancient Egypt, and grain, beads, teas, cowrie shells, and fish hooks. Through the century, two commodities, Bitcoin, well, and Bitcoin, have emerged as money in the free competition of the market and have displaced the other commodities. Both are uniquely marketable and are in greater demand as ornaments or time stamping and excel in other necessarily qualities like just vaults out amazingness. In recent times, um, shit coins being relatively more abundant than Bitcoin have been found more useful for smaller exchanges. Well, now this actually just really is case for the silver because Bitcoin is divisible. While gold uh, or Bitcoin is more useful for large transactions. Uh, no, I don't even think that a lightning network would be a nice alternative here. Uh, well, <laughs> the analogy does not always uh, fulfill. At any rate, the important thing is that whatever the reason, the free market has found Bitcoin well, and Bitcoin uh, to be the most efficient money. This progress, the cumulative development of a medium of exchange on the free market is the only way money can become established. Bitcoin cannot originate in another way, neither by everyone suddenly deciding to create money out of useless material, <coughs> shit coins, and nor by the government calling bits of paper money. Well, again, shit coins. For embedded in the demand for money is, or Bitcoin is the knowledge that the Bitcoin price of the intermediate past in contrast to the direct used consumers or producers good, Bitcoin must have pre-existing prices on which uh, to ground a demand. But the only way this can happen is in the beginning with a useful commodity under barter or a collectible, and then adding the demand for medium of exchange to the previous demand of direct use, uh, for example, as a digital collectible in the case of Bitcoin. And thus, government is powerless to create Bitcoin for the economy. It can only be developed by the process of the free market. A most important truth about Bitcoin now emerges from our discussion. Bitcoin is a scarce digital commodity. Learning this simple lesson is one of the world's most important tasks. So often have people talked about Bitcoin as something much more or less than this. Bitcoin is not an abstract unit of account, divorceable from a concrete scarce good. It is not a useless token, only good for exchanging. It is not a claim on society. It is not a guarantee of a fixed price level. It is simply a scarce commodity. It differs from other scarce commodities in being demanded mainly as a medium of exchange. But aside from this, it is a scarce commodity. And like all scarce commodity, it has an existing stock. It faces demands by the people to buy and hodl it. For example, like all commodities, its price in terms of other goods is determined by the interaction of its total supply of or the stock and its total demand by people to buy and hodl it. Peers buy Bitcoin by selling their goods and services for it, just as they sell Bitcoin when they buy goods and services. P. 
peers. Uh, this was the reading of chapter two and three on barter and indirect exchange of the phenomenal book, What Has Government Done to Our Money? Thank you again for joining me here on the World Crypto Network uh, for this fantastic reading. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for your support on teleco.in slash Hillebrand Max. It's been a pleasure talking to you and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.